So over the last uh, week, um, we were at Sarah's aunt's lake house on Smith Mountain Lake. And so this has been our yearly tradition to do this. And we go and it's uh, you know, when the weather's nice, it's wonderful. The weather was beautiful this week. We had the chance, when the kids are there, we've got the chance that we sort of fall into a rhythm of what we do. So we get up and we eat breakfast and then we go down to the water and we swim and swim and swim. And then uh, eventually it's, it's lunchtime. So we come in and we're crashing inside for lunch before we're going back out in the afternoon. And so when you're crashing for lunch, you turn something on just to sort of watch. And they, uh, at, the, at the lake, there's no Wi-Fi. So it is, uh, it's interesting the kinds of things that we watch, but fortunately, Sarah's aunt has a big sh shelf full of all sorts of movies. And so uh, we always just put on some sort of random movie. And uh, the most beautiful words came out of my daughter's mouth this week is, as on one of the days she looked at me and she said, Dad, I know, I know what we want to watch. You do? I'm thinking some sort of, you know, kids movie or whatever. And she said, we need to watch The Princess Bride. I said, yes, we do. Yes, we do. And so, uh, and so we're, we're watching The Princess Bride. And if you have not seen The Princess Bride, you can come see Sarah later, who will quote you the entire movie, uh, just word for word. She sets it up and does voices. It's very exciting. So, um, <clears throat> but... The, uh, so it's this fantastical story with uh, princess and with pirates and with all sorts of crazy things going on. And so there's a scene where the three thieves have kidnapped the princess and there is a masked man trailing them. And so they climb up the cliffs of insanity and the masked man is climbing on the rope behind them. They get up to the top and to, in order to get rid of the masked man, they cut the rope and they all look over the edge and he is hanging on and continues to just climb by hand up where Vizzini, the head of the, uh, the, the three kidnappers says, okay, you grab her and come with me. You stay here and finish him. And the one who is supposed to stay there and finish him is Inigo Montoya. And Inigo Montoya has one, char his character arc is, is one note, right? Like he has one thing that his life is about, and that is vengeance. Because a one man, a six-fingered man, killed his father when he was younger. And so he is going to go up when he finds that man, and he's going to say what? Hello, my name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father prepared to know, and also with you. So, uh, and that's what you thought you would, that's what you thought you would be quoting at church today, right? So anyway, he's waiting to see if this is the guy, but he's bored. Literally, he's bored waiting for this guy to climb up. And he goes, hey, uh, could you, could you pick it up? Pick up the pace a little bit? And the guy goes, I'm going as fast as I can. You know, you, you could help if you wanted. And the, and, uh, the and Nigo says, well, you want me to throw you down a rope? And the guy goes, well, how do I know that you're not just gonna let go of the rope once I am on the rope? And he says, I give you my word as a Spaniard. And the, and the masked man goes, not, not good, I've known too many Spaniards. <laughs> and he goes, and he thinks for a second and he goes, I swear on the soul of my father, Domingo Montoya, you will make it up this cliff. And the masked man, as he's hanging on, locks eyes and goes, throw me the rope. So he throws him the rope and then you just have to watch for the rest of it. But, <laughs> but I, I, knowing that, uh, you know, the, the, the curse of what I do is that I always know there are sermons coming up, even on vacation. And so knowing it was going to happen, that sort of, that scene, that moment lodged itself in my brain because what was happening right there is these two people who don't know each other, one of them is trying to convince the other one literally to put their, li their life in his hands and what he says was not, I promise, not you really should, not doesn't this face look trusting? What he says was, I swear. What he was doing was swearing an oath. Now, 
uh, my guess is that many of you did not lose sleep last night wondering about the Christian response to oath making in your life. Like that was not what you spent your time thinking about. If it was, boy, you really came on the right Sunday. But if you didn't, it's because when we talk about oaths, we talk about it in very specific settings in very specific ways, right? When you're under oath, you're in a courtroom, right? When you take an oath, you are either, again, in a courtroom or you are in the military or you're in civil service. You're doing some sort of thing that requires you to do an oath. We don't talk about oaths very much. And yet, we are walking through the Sermon on the Mount. This is chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. This is Jesus' longest recorded, you know, connected talk. And in this talk, he dedicates an entire section to oaths. Now, we then could look at that and go, oh, well, that's too bad that there's this whole section of what Jesus talks about that doesn't actually affect our lives anymore. Or we could stop and say, okay, what is Jesus trying to get at here? And why do these words still mean something and still speak truth to what God has for me today? Because when we're talking about the Sermon on the Mount, what we're talking about is Jesus' picture of what kingdom life looks like. If you want to walk into the kingdom, if you want to be part of God's kingdom, and you want to be transformed into who God wants you to be, if you want a picture and a life of what the, the perfect sort of Christian life looks like, we look to the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus is spelling out the details, the ethics, the way that you are called to live. And there is something here that we need, something here that we should unpack and better understand. So uh, if you will uh, turn with me, you can, if you brought your Bible, you're invited to use that, obviously. If, otherwise, there should be a Bible under your seat or the seat in front of you. We have a Bible on our church app if you are interested in that, or obviously there's all sorts of other ways you can get it. You can also just listen. Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 33. So Matthew, chapter 5, verse 33. Jesus is speaking, and he says, Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, Do not break your oath, but keep the oaths that you have made to the Lord. But I tell you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Do not swear by your head, for you cannot make even one hair white or black. Simply let your yes be yes, and your no, no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. Okay, <clears throat> so in Jesus' time, there was a lot more of this kind of language of, uh, hey, did you take that? No, I didn't take that. Come on, you definitely took that. No, I swear by the city of Jerusalem that I didn't take that. I swear by heaven. I swear by my own head that I didn't take that. There was a lot of this sort of personal oath kind of language that was happening. And part of what Jesus is doing is talking about this, but again, I haven't heard many of you swear by Jerusalem lately. So, I, so we need to try and figure out and, and wrap into what, what does this mean and what are we doing here? And to do that, people have wrestled with this question for as long as, as people have heard Jesus say this. Because they've wrestled with the question of, are we not allowed to swear any oaths at all? And there are different sects of Christianity that have said, yes, absolutely. You, and even to this day, they still don't participate in anything that requires them to make an oath because they think from this verse, Jesus doesn't want them to do that. There are, so there's this whole chunk of people that do that. There's this whole chunk of people that say, that's not exactly what Jesus is getting at. And, you know, honestly, there's not really a right or wrong answer here that we can affirm. You can ask Jesus when you get to heaven. But the, 
I fall into this camp, and, I, and part of why I fall into this camp is the very last verse. Because the very last verse isn't necessarily about you swearing an oath in court. The very last verse and the whole Sermon on the Mount is the picture of how you are going to live and what you are going to do and what sort of consistent life you are, how the practices of your life are going to be so that they clearly and purposely point to something. So, while we may not be swearing by Jerusalem, while we may not be swearing by our head, well, you do know people, and maybe you do, who go, did you take that? No, I didn't take that. Come on, you took that. No, I swear I didn't take that. Or, I swear to God. And you fill it in with whatever comes after that, right? There are people who say that sort of language. Why do, we, why do we use that kind of language? What we're trying to do is we're trying to intensify our words. We're, and even though we may not realize we're doing it, we're trying to add penalty behind our words. We're trying to add some sort of depth so that you know that we are serious about it. When Inigo looks down and swears on the soul of his father, the most important person in his world, the person who his whole life is bent on getting vengeance for, he is saying that I stake the most important thing I have on these words I'm about to speak. What Jesus is saying here is that you shouldn't, you don't need to do that. It's not necessary to do that. And you don't have to do that. Why? Because kingdom life, Christian life is lived in such a way that when you speak, people are going to assume what you're saying is truthful. People are going to assume that what you're saying is the honest truth. You don't have to intensify your words because you understand as a Christian, your words already carry weight. Your words, you know, there's a uh, uh, different... Uh, different ways that people understand this. You know, some, one uh, fantasy series talks about, you know, oh, you lied, and the, the people who did lie go, <laughs> words are wind. And in some ways, we talk like that, and we, we use words like that, don't we? But we know that words aren't wind, and we know the old, you know, the old rhyme that words will never hurt me is the most ridiculously wrong-headed thing ever, right? Because we can and unfortunately do use our words to wound other people. We use our words to separate and divide. We use our words to cut and we use our words to, to isolate ourselves at times. Whether we know it or not, there, you know, everything that we say is either drawing us closer to people or separating us further. When we snap at people, when we make fun of them, when we mock them, hey, when we gossip about them behind their back, watch out, we suddenly are separating ourselves both from God and from community. We are using words and the weight of them is pressing down and separating. In the same way, words can also build up. Think about the time that you screwed up. There's no way that you can get out of it. It is you that screwed up here. You go to the person who is either in charge of whatever it is or the person you have to confess to and say, look, I screwed up and it was bad. Expecting and deserving some sort of punishment, some sort of wrath, some sort of attack. And in that moment, they forgive you or they say, you know what? It's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. That is using words to bring back together. Jesus understands the power of words and he understands that when you participate in the system of oaths, what you're doing is you're weakening words. Because what, what you're implying here is all my normal talk, I'm probably lying. When you want to know that I'm really telling the truth, I'm going to swear on something so you really believe me. All this other time, eh, roll the dice and see, right? What Jesus is saying is, why on earth would you participate in this system? Why on earth would you be a part of this? Why on earth would you use, this, use language in this way to imply that you aren't trustworthy the rest of the time you talk? It's only when I say I swear that you can really hold on to it. That what Jesus is doing, I believe, is inviting us into the reality where we understand the value of every single word we say, and we understand the witness 
of our words. Because that's what it is. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks, which is one of the most uh, beautiful but also scary verses in Scripture. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Think about what you've said lately. And think about the condition of your heart. The way that you use language, Jesus cares about deeply. Because the way you use language witnesses to the condition of your heart. And if you are a Christian, it witnesses to what you believe faith is. So these words matter. Words aren't wind. Words hold on and have power. You don't need to swear an oath because everything you say should be spoken in truth. Now, we have to add, whenever we say that, we always have to add something on the end here. Because there are people, not you, but people, there are people who hear that and think that I have just handed them a sledgehammer so that they can go drop truth bombs on anybody they want to because Jesus wants me to be truthful in everything, right? We use scripture to interpret scripture. And so part of what we do is that we understand that we speak the truth, but scripture also says that we speak the truth in love. So we find ways that we share truth. We don't lie to people. We don't, you know, we don't misuse and obfuscate. We don't separate people. But when we speak truth, we speak truth in love. It doesn't mean we can't say hard words. It doesn't mean we can't say difficult things. And it doesn't mean we can't be, we can't, have tough conversations. What it means is that all of our words are filled with Christ's love because again, our words are witness. So we don't do oaths, not because Jesus is really mad if you swear an oath in court or if you join the military or if you do whatever. We don't do oaths, not because the actual act of an oath is bad. We don't participate in, in oaths in our own sort of speech and life because we don't have to. It's a belt and suspenders kind of thing. If you're already telling the truth, you don't have to swear that you're telling the truth because you are supposed to be telling the truth. This is what God calls you to. God calls you to understand the power of your words. God calls you to understand that out of the overflow of your heart come your words. God calls you to pay attention to what you are saying and to speak so honestly and so truthfully, so consistently that people assume your yes is yes and your no is no. That's what God has for you. That's what God wants for us. That's what gives witness to Christianity. And you know why it gives witness? Because, hello, our world uses words in the exact opposite way, right? You, you know, we, uh, the other thing we do when we're at the lake is that we watch commercials. We don't ever watch commercials at home because we don't have cable TV. So we watch Netflix or Hulu or whatever. So commercials are new and exciting. And commercials make all sorts of promises, right? <laughs> this is going to be the most amazing thing ever. Look, a real testimonial from this person who before, you know, like the infomercial where they're like wounding themselves with a cup somehow until they get the thing that pours it for them, you know, and we have found ways to use words to manipulate as a culture. We have found ways to use words that wound as a culture and we celebrate that in so many ways. We see it and we celebrate it and it makes Jesus cry because what we are doing is we are actively and gleefully wounding other people, which is the exact opposite of who Christ is and what Christ has for us. So what Christ has for us is to stand counter to the culture, to not just say what needs to be said so that you can get ahead or manipulate, to not just say what needs to be said so that you can sell whatever you need to sell or so that you can convince somebody to do whatever you need them to do. You use words in such a way that your honesty stands out and it will shine like a star in our culture if you are honest. It will shine like a star. It will shine and people will want to know. They will look at you with ridiculous incredu incredulity. Credulity. They will look incredulous at you. They'll be real shocked. 
and they will say, what are you doing? They'll sort of be mocking. What are you doing? Because it is so ridiculous, right? It is so counter to what everybody does. We tell the white lie, we cut corners, we do the little things. It's not really cheating on the taxes because they, they stole my money first, right? We do the little things that are necessary to make it because that's what our culture does. But what if God's calling you to something different? What's God, in Jesus' original culture, God, he was saying, step outside of what this is. Step outside of this common practice because this doesn't reflect well on you or on God. Step outside of this and be different and live differently and be transformed. May your words be your witness. May your words speak and point to a heart that is continually being shaped and changed more into the image of Jesus Christ, because this is what God has for you. This is the good news, that you don't have to do these sorts of silly oaths anymore. You don't have to swear to anything to get people to believe you, because you are going to live in such a way, empowered by the Holy Spirit, not just under your own strength, but God is going to move and transform you in such a way so that your yes will be yes, your no will be no, and that's all you have to say. May your words be your witness. Would you pray with me? God, too often we treat words like wind, and we just blow them everywhere regardless of how they wound or hurt or distance us. So God, we pray that you will give us weight to our words, that you will help us understand the truth, that we don't have to swear by anything, but through you, our yes can be yes and our no can be no. God, transform our hearts, transform our lives, and transform our words so that all that we say, all that we think, and all that we do points us back to you. We love you and we thank you. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.